Hello, my name is John England. I'm a lead civil engineer at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Risk Management Center. My primary areas of expertise are flood hydrology and hydraulics. Let's get started with this presentation for best practices. Today we'll be discussing the third chapter under embankments and foundations, chapter D3, overtopping failure. We'll focus on three objectives, mechanisms for overtopping and wave overwash, event tree for overtopping, and probability of failure with breach erosion or fragility curves. Failure of dams and levees due to overtopping is a common failure mode. Over 30% of dams failed in the US are attributed to overtopping. We'll discuss key factors such as overtopping depth, duration, and dam crest materials. Over embankments may be particularly vulnerable. We'll show some case histories next to illustrate the concepts. Here we have Lake Delhi dam failure. It's near Delhi, Iowa, and it failed on July 24, 2010. One spillway gate was not operational. As you can see here in this upper right corner with this gate closed. This contributed to overtopping. The dam underwent internal erosion, specifics were unknown, and was overtopped causing a 200 foot portion of the earth and embankment and roadway to breach, emptying the reservoir about 3,800 acre feet. No life loss occurred, but about 8,000 people were evacuated. In early February 1986, over 10 inches of rain fell on the Sacramento region uh, in several days and was with warm temperatures melted a ripe Sierra Nevada snowpack and caused a huge flood down the American River, um, pouring into on the middle fork of the American River into Folsom Lake. Rising water overtopped the cofferdam near the right abutment, causing a waterfall that quickly eroded into the structure. Although the cofferdam was designed with a soft earthen plug to fail in a controlled manner, if an event were to occur, the structure eroded quicker than expected. Breach outflow surged downstream into um, the full Folsom Lake, uh, depositing cofferdam debris and raising their lake level suddenly. Folsom Dam outflow reached 134,000 CFS, which was exceeded the design capacity of the levees downstream um, into Sacramento, but the levees held and they weren't overtopped. So the city um, avoided um, flooding by a very close margin. Here's a mechanical failure um, le leading to overtopping. This is a famous case from FERC, um, the upper reservoir of Tom Sock Pump Storage Dam. It was overtopped in uh, 2005 when water continued to be pumped up um, from the lower reservoir after the upper was full, leading to a catastrophic failure of a triangular section of the reservoir wall. The failure was a result of combination of design and construction flaws, including continuing to operate, um, operate the dam when the primary system for the water level was known to be inaccurate and overfilling the reservoir, and there was no emergency spillway. No one was, uh, no loss of life occurred, but a downstream park superintendent, his wife, and three children were swept away uh, while still in their home. Here's one from Central Michigan. This is Rainbow da Lake Dam on Pine Creek. It failed in September 1986 due to extreme rainfalls in that area. The dam was 46 feet tall, 800 feet long, had about a 30 foot wide crest with four to one side slopes and a rectangular drop inlet spillway, but no emergency spillway. It was constructed of well compacted sandy silt clay with a small amount of gravel. It failed after overtopping about 14 hours with a maximum depth of about one and a half to two feet. An eyewitness, interestingly, stated that the erosion which resulted in breach and failure started in an area where vegetation cover was really sparse or non-existent due to presence of a road or trail angling down the downstream side of the embankment. Here's another big flood, uh, this one in Pennsylvania, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. 
uh, Laurel Run Dam it failed on July 20th, 1977. The cause of failure was due to an inadequate spillway. It also had some stability issues, first identified as early as 1943. Um, an assessment in 1959 noted an, an inadequate spillway, less than half the size desired by the state. It was classified as high hazard in 1970, and unfortunately, uh, there wasn't any modification prior to this event happening. Uh, torrential rainstorms of about 12 inches of rain in eight hours, um, overtopping the crest of the dam. Gibson Dam uh, is a case study from um, history from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, this dam was finished construction in uh, 1929. It's a concrete gravity arch dam, about 199 feet tall. On June 6 through 8, 1964, a record rainstorm, one of the record rainstorms that's used in um, the hydrometeorological reports, uh, HMR 55A and 57, uh, a rainstorm fell on heavy snowpack. The spillway radial gates were not fully open. So you'll hear this over and again at this, um, through this talk about the issues with gates and overtopping. Two gates were completely open, two gates completely closed, and two were partially open, all contributing to the overtopping. It overtopped for about three feet over the parapet for about 20 hours, but did not fail. And notice this right abutment overflow. Subsequently modified in 1981 to allow overtopping um, by up to about 12 feet, as you can see here on this um, right abutment section with uh, um, anchors uh, and uh, concrete apron. Details on ICO Bolton 82 on spillways. Here's a couple examples from Hurricane Katrina, um, some levee examples, and these are interesting for reasons you'll see in a minute. This left side is the South Eye Wall breach along the east side of the Inter Harbor a Navigation Canal. It was likely due to a rotational failure of the eye wall after overtopping flood water, scoured the soil supporting the back side of the flood protection. Uh, it's been since replaced by T Wall. The residential area behind this is the Lower Ninth Ward, and Bayou um, Bienvenue is off to the left. On the right, we've got um, a section of eroded levees along the northeast edge of the St. Bernard a Parish uh, Protected Basin near the Mississippi River um, Gulf Outlet Channel. The landslide is to the left and the water side is on this side to the right. The embankment was about 15 to 7 feet, 15 feet tall and primarily uh, constructed with hydraulic fill materials that were dredged from the adjacent Mr. Go Channel, no compaction. In contrast with this, um, we've got some levees uh, in this area for this event that um, withstood some overtopping. So this is important to consider when you're doing the conditional failure probabilities. So the left side, we've got this looking south, which is a clay levee being overtopped um, by an unknown amount with wind wave um, overwash. It's on the south side of the Michoud New Orleans East area along the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Over top, but did not breach. On the right side, this is a levee along the east flank of the New Orleans East section. It was along um, an area where they um, use a lot of clay Pleistocene soils that were really um, compacted well uh, with optimal moisture content. Five erosional breaches near this area did occur from hydraulic fill, uh, but not this section. Complete lack of erosional damage something to consider as we go through the rest of this talk. There are two ways for dam or levees to overtop. One is overwash and continuous. The second is continuous overtopping. Overwash occurs when wind driven waves wash over the dam crest. Overtopping is a rising water level with a continuous depth over the crest of the levee or the dam. Both should be considered in the same failure mode. Here's an illustration of wave overwash. In this case, the still water level is below the embankment crest. Wind generated waves then can potentially overtop the embankment. The key variables for that are the wind velocity, direction, reservoir surface area, uh, and distance or fetch setup. The still water level is obtained um, from the reservoir or river stage frequency curve, as we discussed in chapter B1 on hydrologic hazards. 
Overtopping depth, duration, and type of structure are critical to evaluate an overtopping failure mode. So here again are some of our case histories. On the left is an embankment. So as we can read here, most embankments and levees would likely not withstand sustained overtopping at all. Rainbow Dam failed after about overtop for about 14 hours, but it had a four to one slope, um, max overtopping depth of one to two feet. Gibson Dam, here the concrete gravity arch dam on the right, overtopped for about 20 hours for three feet, but did not fail. We'll discuss embankment processes and event trees. Then we'll go into um, some brief, simple ones for concrete dams. The breaching mechanism shown on the, on the left is a head cutting failure. Notice the vertical face of the head cut that forms due to the presence of cohesion in the embankment materials. We start off in both cases on left and right with um, constant water over uh, an embankment crest. The figure on the right shows erosion and breach mechanism, typical of a cohesionless uh, granular materials. Both may be applicable if a dam has a cohesionless shell and a cohesive core as usually constructed. Key factors for event trees, overtopping, head cut forms, progression, and then breach initiates. Alternately, progressive erosion of the downstream surface through the shell. Now, there are four primary ways um, of embankment erosion processes, as you um, saw earlier uh, in the talk on erosion of rock and soil, in chapter D1. Here we review them just for a refresh. The first is surface detachment. So you're plucking up materials, you know, and lowering uh, in the vertical direction here shown as Y. The second one is a plunging uh, or impinging jet scour where you've got some plunge pool that erodes here due to a, a jet. The third area is widening. So the, the um, once you initiate erosion, um, it will widen in many cases before it goes uh, in depth. And lastly, um, you'll get migration where it will move backwards. In that case, the impending jet uh, sc um, scour is a function of the peak stress applied by the jet. And there are further details on the rate of widening and head cut migration in uh, chapter D1 with simplified breach models. So here are some pictures illustrating an overtopping event and head cut initiation. So here we've got at uh, the Stillwater um, ARS Outdoor Laboratory with their bridge shown here. We've got some pool and we've initiated an overtopping event and we've got head cut um, happening. Next up, we've got uh, migration where the head cut goes backwards um, into the embankment materials. Breach occurs, and then we've got complete failure um, as the reservoir um, pool is exhausted and has gone through the embankment. We need to capture each one of these in our event trees in these sequences. One of the key factors that's actually pretty um, basic is accurate elevations. And many times we don't actually have these. Accurate ele ele elevations across the embankment, a dike, a levee crest are needed to evaluate overtopping. Recent surveys need to be performed to help identify low spots and areas vulnerable to flow concentrations. Usually we get some consolidation or regional subsidence um, can lower crests. Uh, or cause some settlement of embankments. Let's get onto some big factors here. The hydrologic hazard curve frequency of overtopping is really the primary factor for this potential failure mode. And as stated here, levees obviously you can overtop at much greater frequency than dams due to differences in design criteria. There are many factors though that can also increase water surface elevations and we need to take these into account. These include debris blockage, system operation changes on a large river system. These are particularly important. Um, changes in modeling techniques uh, where we're using different models now, um, like 2D effects with RAS 2D, as opposed to uh, one-dimensional flows. Uh, increases in magnitudes or increases in estimated frequency of the floods. 
and sediment, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. Important factors that can influence the likelihood of overtopping failure are listed here. Depth and duration are really the key ones. Next are um, low spots and concentration of flows. Following those are materials. So in your heterogeneous materials, um, you've got some shell with some say very, very coarse material um, with soil protection, and you got some shell, and then you got some core. Um, changes in those materials are particularly important to capture, as well as changes in slope and um, changes in embankment properties as you move down slope. Uh, fetch wind setup is important to, to capture. And um, lastly, in this um, fragility curves and system response curves, these are really site specific. So you have to use all your geometry at your site of interest to develop those response curves. The sequence of events leading to an embankment failure from overtopping are listed as follows. Simply said, we start with a flood or in a very, very, very high reservoir level that's over the crest of the embankment and overtopping initiates. This is different than, than what you heard Todd speak earlier on the spillway erosion um, chapter because we've got water going over the crest of the embankment rather than just the spillway. After erosion um, overtopping is initiated, we get some erosion or removal of some vegetation or slope protection. So it could be plucking of rocks um, on the downstream sh shell uh, for a rock fill dam or vegetation is removed on the embankment. Then erosion is initiated um, along the downstream slope or at the end of the crest or a change in slope and say the downstream toe and a head cut forms. Particles are transported, we get some erosion happening, and then we get some um, deepening and widening of the advanced uh, head cut and the embankment crest is lowered and eventually breach occurs. In some cases, uh, it doesn't lead to a complete breach. That's the part you'll have to figure out. So here's a simplified event tree uh, for overtopping. And let's talk about some of these nodes here. This one has three. We've got water surface elevation. We've got flood loads. And then we've got breach. Pretty simple. The three node tree might be appropriate for just a screening level uh, assessment or po for a portfolio risk assessment. The nodal probabilities are from the reservoir elevation percentages, percentages of time the reservoir has been at that elevation, flood load ranges for that elevation, what the probabilities are from the hazard curve, and then team judgment, just basically saying, okay, we're given this reservoir elevation um, and this depth over the crest, we consider dam breach exceedingly likely at 0.999. Pretty simple. The level of detail of the hydrologic and hydraulic modeling for this failure mode and the success of nodes that are developed really depends on the level of study. So this we're showing a screening level estimate. You know, a stage uh, frequency curve really dictates what the frequency is and the potential for overtopping. Good for screening. However, though, we really have to focus next on, you know, breach occurs and um, what its materials and mechanics are, are doing. So the next step for a higher level study is to do some hydrologic modeling and then figure out the mechanistic approach so that we can estimate nodes and know um, what estimate those, what those characteristics are using something like wind dam C for head cuts, erosion progression, and breach formation. Here's an example of an event uh, tree for overtopping with nodes. These illustrate the team's uh, assessment of regression leading to failure. So the nodes are constructed based on the data, the site characteristics, and the modeling studies performed for this failure mode. So for this example, the team combined surface protection and head cut initiation in a single node. That may work for this case, other ones you may want to separate that. It is recommended to use erosion models such as wind dam C and breach models to estimate the head cut advancement and breach progression, so you have those rates. 
Details for breach progression are in chapter C1. Now on embankment breach, there are screening level, intermediate and advanced tools to estimate breach initiation and progression. Screening level methods are based on case histories and equations. RMC breach suite uh, contains some spreadsheet tools for calculations. The level of effort listed here should be informed by the type of study being done. So again, screening risk assessment for an embankment should be a different effort than those for higher order or quantitative risk assessments. We want to go to intermediate and then some more advanced tools besides using the simplified um, breach methods. So what would those look like? Some physically based breach models are listed here. These are appropriate for quantitative risk assessments, issue evaluations. So do we want to um, look into the characteristics for wind dam? Perhaps we want to go do some um, jet erosion tests uh, and physically based methods in the field to take into account the types of materials and sample them in situ in what we have there. Um, get detailed geometry for input for wind dam, or perhaps HR breach, or even RAS2D. Uh, best practice currently is to combine results from several uh, equations and critically evaluate those assumptions and conduct sensitivity analysis. For concrete dams, here are the major factors that influence the likelihood of failure for overtopping. Really, it's all about foundation joints and conditions. What are the joint fracturing and bedding looks like and erosion resistance and durability? Tailwater elevations can be um, a critical factor and if mechanical and electrical control is still operational. So on the left here, we've got our, our famous Gibson Dam case with the three gates, uh, excuse me, two gates that weren't even open and two that were partially open that led to the overtopping. So we had some gate malfunctions. On the right here, we've got Morrow Point Dam. This is another reclamation a uh, very famous uh, double curvature thin arch dam over 468 feet tall and so there's at least 350 feet of plunge pool here with these um, fixed wheel gates that are the spillway uh, opening these orifice spillways and so you've got to look at the joint characteristics and um, the foundation characteristics on the thin arch dam which may be vulnerable um, for plunge pools and things like that that may initiate the erosion so here's a simple event tree for a concrete dam overtopping, and maybe a thin arch dam like Morrow Point or something in your neck of the woods. Um, and it has four nodes. First, we got some flood load ranges, again, from your hazard curve. Uh, next, we have uh, erosion initiates. So you've got some sort of plunging jet that starts to get the rock to move. Third step is we've got erosion uh, starts to undermine the dam. And lastly, the extent of the erosion fails the dam. So in order to get these right, you have to integrate hydraulics, rock mechanics, site geology, and foundation. So those key areas are performed to estimate the probabilities for these last um, two to three nodes. So refer to chapter D1 on rock uh, erosion sections and the hydraulic characteristics and the geology on this. There are several areas of uncertainty that need to be considered in, in overtopping potential ferry mode estimates. Really, these are like sensitivity, they're not quantitative uncertainty in many cases, uh, and other cases they are. So hydrologic hazards is one main area. We're doing a pretty good job here at doing quantitative uncertainty. When we get to routings and some other factors, some of those are really more order of magnitude estimates that are best handled in sensitivity rather than essentially full distributions on some of those soil parameters. So on the right, we've got five areas, initial and antecedent reservoir water surface elevations, operation and misoperation, spillway discharge, um, embankment performance, and soil erosion. Let's go these through these uh, fairly quickly um, at the end here. The initial reservoir water surface elevation is a critical input. But use of tools such as RMC RFA allow for direct consideration of variations in initial reservoir level and seasonality in reservoir water surface elevations uh, that initiate uh, during the flood. Operations and misoperations uh, are equally important 
uh, can be uh, shift reservoir water surface elevations and stage frequency curves by an order of magnitude. So gates and operations need to be carefully evaluated. There are sometimes large uncertainties in spillway discharge and rating curves for floods greater than the design event. Debris and gate hydraulics need to also be evaluated. So beyond the model studies that um, are used in many cases for reclamation and, and uh, Corps of Engineers dams, um, those are idealized curves. We need to go beyond them. Challenges with embankment performance uh, need to include load partitions, overtopping duration, which is very key, and surface protection. How well does that work? So when there's small variations, so you have a run of the river dam uh, that generates hydro for FERC, and there would be small elevation differences um, and breakpoints in the um, response curve. Those need to be taken into account in the event tree. Additional factors that affect embankment performance during overtopping. Zonation. How's that rock shell doing over that clay core? Pretty good for most dams. Um, how can we analyze that? Breaks in the downstream slope. There could be dams like in California where you have um, seismic stability berms that change uh, and move flow to concentrate perhaps along the groin. And erosion mechanisms as we discussed with wind dam and knowing um, the inputs to that. Use sensitivity analysis on the soil erosion model parameters. Erodibility coefficient KD is particularly challenging, as noted in Chapter D1. Uh, breach models are very, very sensitive to that, as well as critical shear stress. Um, need to be able to do some um, perhaps in situ testing to estimate those parameters and realize that all models are simplifications of reality. So in conclusion, um, many dams and levees have failed from overtopping. Flow and overwash need to be considered uh, for both dams and levees, and depth and duration are key factors. The erosion mechanism um, for embankments in particular depends on cohesive and cohesionless materials, head cutting and sediment transport relations. They all need to be considered. And erodibility is a key factor on embankments and foundation for rocks is a, erodibility is a key factor for concrete dams. Thank you for your attention. We now have some time for questions and discussion.